God has taken somebody out of your life, whether that's somebody walking away or God has literally shown you something about this person, revealed their true colors, and you have had to walk away. But there's something inside of you that's saying, I want that back. I want that person back. And when we uh, you know, and this could be a friendship, this could be a family member, this could be a significant other. But when there's a breakup, right, we're so used to having that person there for support. What happens is we, our brain goes into all the great things, all the memories and nothing of the bad, right? And I think a lot of us can relate to that. But I'm going to give you an analogy to show you what happens when you do this, okay? Uh, when you go back to what God has delivered you from. Because the Bible says in Job 121, The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Praise the name of the Lord. So here's Charlie. She's three years old. And she is, her dad gave her a, a cup of Kool-Aid. Who drinks Kool-Aid anymore? I don't. But she put some Elmer's glue in there, right? And she has no idea. She thinks it looks like marshmallow. She has no idea that if she drinks it, she, now the Kool-Aid, she is going to get very sick and maybe even die. I'd have to look it up. But Charlie uh, puts that Elmer's glue in there and her dad is watching from afar and saying, mm -mm, she's going to try to drink that this weird concoction she just made, I'm going to take that away from her. Why? Because I love her and I know that she's going to get sick if she drinks it. And when he takes it away from her, what happens? Charlie, because she's so young and doesn't know, she's not mature enough, she starts fretting against her dad. She starts saying, why did you do this? Why did you take away the Kool-Aid that I was going to drink? Why... Uh, why are you taking something good away from me? I don't understand. And what does she do? She goes and tries to reach for it and he puts it on the top of a fridge. And somehow she jumps on the counter. I used to jump on the counter all the time when I was little. And she grabs it from the fridge and she drinks it and she gets very sick. The Bible says that a dog returns to its own vomit. We don't want to be like a dog. We don't want to be like Charlie, who's three years old and is not understanding what's going on here. Okay, when God takes somebody out of your life, he's taking somebody toxic or poisonous, uh, an abusive person out of your life. And when we try to reach back for this, this is what happens. Three things happen when you go back to somebody that you know you shouldn't go back to. Number one, it's demonstrating a few things. We are lacking spiritual maturity in this area. Why? Because only a baby doesn't understand why they can't drink something toxic. It's only a baby doesn't understand uh, that the father is taking it away because it's not good. Number two, it shows us that we don't trust our father. We don't trust God. And number three, it shows us that we are either idolizing this person or we are depending on this person the way we should be depending on God. Because whether God takes somebody away from my life or whatever, I am in the, I'm at the point, and this has happened to me where I've gone back to the Kool-Aid. I'm, I'm going to share about my testimony here, but I am at the point where I'm so content with Jesus that it doesn't matter if the whole world rejects me, the whole world leaves me because I have the greatest treasure. I have my best friend. I have Jesus. I have everything I need. I don't need one more blessing. I don't need one more prayer answered. I don't need anything else. And this walk with God is not about me. It's about him, right? But even, even God tells a married couple a married believer who is married to an unbeliever, okay? Unequally yoked for whatever reason it is. He says in 1 Corinthians seven fifteen, but if the husband or wife who isn't a believer insists on leaving, let them go. In such cases, the believing husband or wife is no longer bound to the other for God has called you to live in peace. He's saying, let them go. 
go. Even in a covenant, God is saying, let them go if they want to go. If they want to go, let them go. Sometimes God will hide your worth from somebody in order to uh, protect you from settling for less, from making a grave mistake, et cetera, et cetera. And he will have, and rejection is often God's protection. So don't let somebody's inability to, to see your worth define it. Your worth is in Christ. You are worth dying for. You are worth the cross, okay? So I had so many guys reject me. So many guys reject me. I thank God now for that rejection because I know it was God's protection. We weren't equally yoked. They were freaked out because I love God so much. And it was, I was, my whole life was about God. And they were like, you're too much. And I was all hurt about it. I'm going to tell you about a time where uh, I was dating this guy and he was not a believer. Maybe some of you have heard the story, but he claims to be a believer. He uh, went to church. His parents uh, raised him in the Christian church. However, uh, he continued to do drugs. He continued, you know, um, to party. He continued to do all these things. And so uh, I was dating him. And a few months before, God had given me a dream where he was showing me I had to choose between the right guy and the wrong guy. Like the one that God had for me, which is, I believe now, my husband, Lance, and this counterfeit guy that was going to come into my life. And in this dream, way before I met this guy that I'm going to tell you about, uh, let's call him John for the sake of the video. I, The dream showed me that I was marrying him and he said that, you know, he showed this persona of who he was and that he was this wealthy man and um you know he had this beautiful house and whatever and i found out in the dream later on that the house wasn't even his it was his parents fast forward i meet this guy and god was telling me don't go for this guy that's gonna come it's crazy how god will speak to us in our dreams the book of job tells us that god speaks in one way and in another but man does not perceive it in a dream, in a vision of the night, he uh, seals man's instruction when they're slumbering upon their beds. So read that verse. It's really, really cool. Anyways, fast forward and I meet this guy and I'm starting to date him. And uh, basically, I was in a bad place. I was not with the Lord. I had backslidden and I was smoking cigarettes again and I was really depressed and I, I was, I had insomnia. So the doctor gave me Ambien, which <sighs> I'm so against pharmaceutical drugs now. Uh, I haven't even told you guys this, but I was addicted to Xanax at one point. Anyways, that's a whole nother video, but thank God that he delivers from drug addiction. It's amazing. And I was taking Ambien at the time and I, I was trying to come back to the Lord. So when I met him, I was like, listen, I really want to wait until marriage so I can hang out at your house. I can sleep over. You can't do that. You can't do that. You can't, you can't get on the border y'all. We got, we have to have boundaries. But anyways, I was very unwise and I said I could sleep over, but we can't have sex. Eventually he found out that, um, and he, he was starting to be really abusive to me like just getting annoyed with every little thing I did. I would start laughing in public and he would be like, shut up. Like, you know, he didn't love me for who I was. I was seeing that he really wasn't a man of God. He wasn't able to lead me. And uh, he, God was showing me, you know, this is not the person for you. And he was saying, leave. And through my friend, Diane, he kept, you know, telling me and she was warning me, you have to break up with this person. And I, it was like I was going back to my own vomit. I was going back to him. And I broke up with him one time. And then I went back. And when I went back, there was a night where I remember I took the Ambien. And if you know about Ambien, you, you black out. I blacked out. I woke up. And I was in a different shirt. And I looked in the mirror and I'm like, what is going on? You know, how, how do I have a different shirt on? And... Um, he had raped me and this happened 
at least one more time because I remember having another conversation with him, but I think it was around three times to my knowledge because I don't know, it could have happened more. But that wouldn't have happened had I been obedient to the Lord in the first place by not being unequally yoked with an unbeliever. I, and, and, and y'all, hold on because I'm not good at stories. I found out that he, before the rape happened, I found out that this house that he had was a beautiful house. He, it was his parents' house. I found out. He didn't tell me and it slipped out of his mouth. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is the guy from the dream. God uses dreams, y'all. I'm sorry, but listen, Jesus is so real. Like, pfft, I've seen too much. People are like, you know, God isn't real. Listen, listen, you haven't even, if you don't seek him with all your heart, you ain't gonna find him. Seek the Lord with all your heart and he, you will be, you will find him. I promise you, if you seek him with all your heart. And a lot of people, they, they say, oh, how do you seek God with all your heart? Well, if you seek a bouncy ball that you don't really care about, you're going to, you know, in your house and you lost it. Oh, you're going to look a little bit and then you're going to give up. But if you lose your keys, your wallet, your phone, honey, you are flipping up the floorboards looking for that thing. Okay. That is seeking God with all of your heart and letting go of everything else you're seeking and focusing on him. So phone, whatever idols you've got, getting rid of those things and focusing on the Lord. Anyways. Uh, I would not have gotten raped. And that was not God's will for me. You know, and a lot of people want to just blame God because of all their disobedience and all the consequences of their sin when God in the first place told, told them, don't do it. God in the first place said, don't get drunk. God in the first place said, don't, you know, be sober-minded. And then we blame God. You know, I could, I could have sat here and blamed God. God, how, why did you let him rape me? Well, he told me to get out of that relationship time and time again. And I went back to my vomit. And there is a price to pay for that. You know, when Lot and his wife were leaving Sodom and Gomorrah, God, you know, God told them through these two angels, hey, I'm going to burn the city up because of homosexuality and pedophilia and all that stuff that was going on. I don't know if pedophilia, but I can assume that would be part of it. But homosexuality was rampant in Sodom and Gomorrah. He was going to rain down fire. And he wanted to spare Lot and his family. And, he, and the angel told them, do not look back. When you walk out of the city, do not look, look back. And Lot's wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt. It will stunt you. You know, looking back on what God saved you from, looking back on and going back to that relationship. You know, it, it's going to stunt you. You're not going to be able to progress. She was supposed to be with Lot and, and her daughters. She was supposed to be moving forward, but she became a pillar of salt because she decided to look back. Don't look back. Don't look back. Know your worth. God, if God wants you and if God accepts you, who cares who rejects you? Let them go, honey. Let them go. You know, whatever. It is what it is. Some people are only in our lives for a season. Look at Abraham and Lot relatives but there was a point where they all their stuff you know and their servants and everything and their cattle they couldn't they couldn't commingle because it was too much and they needed more room and they had to leave some people are only in your life for a season some people are not friendships or they're not supposed to be friendships but they are uh, uh sent in into your life by the lord for you to minister to them for you to teach them for you to help them so, you know and and maybe you can't even trust them Right? But they're there for you to help for a season. Uh, you know, whatever it is, not everybody's there supposed to be with you for life. Jesus had 12 disciples, but three were the most close, right? I think it was Peter, John. Man, you guys, uh, pregnancy brain. Uh, I'll try to find it and put in the link. Or I'll, put it, I'll put it below. But he had three close friends. He has a close circle. Jesus had a close circle. And so should we. But anyways, uh, when we, we often as human beings, we look to other people. We look to pastors. We look to friends. We look to family, spouses to fill bottles. Now here's what I mean. We all have many bottles within us. 
We have a need, these needs as human beings that God has created us to have. And these bottles are, you got, you got a bottle of empathy, okay? You got a bottle of understanding. You got a bottle of comfort. You got a bottle of love. You got a bottle of confidence in yourself. Somebody that boosts your confidence, like, or, or just confidence in yourself. You got a bottle of needing to be listened to, needing to be heard. You got a bottle of strength. And a lot of times what we do is we, we go to these people to try to fill these bottles and they only have a limited supply. But God, okay, Philippians 4.19, my God shall supply, because he's got an infinite supply, baby, of all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. He's got an infinite, infinite supply of empathy for you. He's got an infinite supply of time to listen to you. He's got an infinite supply of understanding. No one will understand your pain and what you have been through like God. He's been there the whole time. Since birth, he has been there the whole time. Nobody can fill these bottles fully. They can fill like a little bit, right? We all are made in the image of God. We can all give encouragement. We can all give empathy. But only to a certain extent. And we want our parents... We get frustrated when our parents don't understand us, don't have full empathy for us, when our spouses don't have full empathy for us. And that's something I learned in my marriage is that guess what? Only God is going to be able to fill my bottles fully. I can't depend fully on my husband to give me joy, to, you know, all those things, right? And when we depend on others to fill these bottles, when we depend on others to to fill a God-shaped hole in our heart that we were created with. That means a square can't go in there. A, a circle can't go in there. A heart has to go in there, right? You know, the shapes. Uh, God is the only one that can fill this, this God-shaped hole. And we're trying to fill this hole, right? With uh, a car, with money, with, um, with a career, with popularity, with likes, with whatever it is, we're trying to fill that God-shaped hole in our heart that God has created. And we, we find ourselves unsatisfied. That's why there's billionaires that kill themselves. You think money's going to make you happy? You think finally having that career? There's people that went to Harvard that have these amazing careers. They're doctors and they commit suicide. Because you always want something more. But God fills that shape, God-shaped hole in your heart better than... I, guys... My gosh, you don't understand. Well, some of you do. But for the ones that don't understand, listen. There is nothing in this world that can replace God's presence in my life. Oh my goodness. Wow. The love I feel from God. The peace. He's, he's, he's literally... My peace in this crazy world. He is the one I come to when everyone has abandoned me. And trust me, all my all my family, basically on both sides, except a few cousins and things, very few have ostracized me and 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 you know don't talk to me at all for years because of faith, my faith. Friends have abandoned me. I, I can count on my fingers how many friends I have. But God always stays. You need that love. You need his presence. You need him to be your best friend. You need God more than you need this water. More than you need air. You need to be with him. He wants to be with you. He loves you so much. If you only knew. And this is what kills me is that there's so many people that will never know God the way that I've come to know him. That there's so many people that will never feel the love I felt while worshiping him. The presence, his presence. Get in God's presence today. Even if you're mad at him, if you have questions, it doesn't matter. Just get in there. Talk to him. He loves you so much. Just look at the cross if you forgot. He suffered more than any of us. Don't think because you've, you've, you've been suffering that he doesn't love you. That he doesn't care. He's with you through it all. 
when we depend on others the way we should be depending on God, two things will happen. We will get disappointed. And the other person will carry a burden that's too heavy for them. God says, cast your cares upon him for he cares for you. He's like, put it all on me. There's, 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 a, there's a song, there's a country song that says, put it all on me. And it goes, um, put it all on me, wait on me. Hold on. Let me, let me find it. Hold on. I love this song. All on me. This is so good. I think it's Sam something. No. Hold on. I'm sorry. I have to put this. Devin Dawson. Uh, you got my number. You can call on me. If you're in trouble, put the fall on me. When you're mad, you can take it out on me. When it don't add up, you can count on me. When you're low, come get high on me. Make it slow, take your time on me. Said, let it out, come and lay on me. When it gets heavy, put the weight on me. Baby, put it all on me. Put it all on me. That's what God is saying. Put it all on him. Go to him today. He knows. He knows. He knows what you're going through. He loves you so much. So let that person go if they're going to go. And trust the Lord. Because he's got better for you. Whether that's a spouse. Whether that's, you know, if your family loved you, guess what? I have a family in Christ and you guys are my family in Christ too. You guys are one of my biggest encouragements. And I love, I sincerely love each and every one of you. And I thank you for being a support to me. So that's all I had today. I went on and on. I cried <laughs> on camera and I don't cry on camera. But anyways, it is what it is. I love you guys and I hope you're encouraged.